Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. Yuma Frugalistas, and welcome. Today, I have a special guest, and of course, all of my guests are special. This guest is someone who, like me, loves saving money and loves showing people how easy it is to save money. But first, I have a favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast and find it useful for you, please pay it forward by sharing with a friend. And even better, please follow the Joyful Frugalista podcast. Joel Gibson is the campaign director at One Big Switch and Nine Saver. He is a columnist at Nine and a self-professed money-saving nerd. In 2019, he wrote Kill Bills, and now he's updated, expanded, and simplified his money-saving system for the post-COVID cost of living crisis in his new book, Easy Money, Seven Steps to Bust Your Bills. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Serena. Thank you for having me again. I really enjoyed it the first time, and I'm, I'm delighted to be back. I'm so delighted to have you a second time to talk about your new book. So you wrote Kill Books in 2019, and obviously a lot has changed in terms of the economic landscape. I remember back in 2019, people were talking about that that there were going to be changes in economic times, but wow, no one could have predicted what was going to happen in 2020, I don't think. No way. No, I think it's a terrible cliche, but what's happened in the past three years, the the, the amount of change has been unprecedented. We, we, we've, we've not seen so much change in a three-year period in our lifetimes, probably even in a couple of generations. I just had to kind of dip back in and rework. There was so much updating to do in the book and there was so much to add in that probably didn't, money saving tricks and hacks and loopholes that didn't exist three years ago. And of course, had to acknowledge the fact we've just lived through this global pandemic, which has had such a massive impact on people's money lives. And now we've got this kind of global cost of living crisis, this inflationary crisis off the back of the pandemic, which is, for most of us, is the toughest sort of financial period we've ever lived through, or it's about to be in 2023, I think. Yeah, I had to go back. I had to add a whole lot of stuff, take a bunch of stuff out, which is no longer kind of uh, up to date, and also just reorder things to... The reason I've called it easy money this time around is because I've I've ordered every chapter in terms of the easiest through to the less easy ways to save money. So I've really made sure that people who've got minimal time or effort know where to start and can just pluck the low-hanging fruit and hopefully save hundreds or $1,000 plus without spending hours and hours. Um, And that was my goal with this one, was just to make it as easy as possible for people to cope with what is going to be a very, very tricky year money-wise. How easy is it to save money? A lot of people do say to me, look, you know, Serena, you just don't understand how busy I am. Like I've got kids, I've got work, I've got elderly parents I've got to look after. I've got a lot of stuff happening in my life. I just don't have time to make those phone calls or to do those comparisons. It's just all too difficult. Is it possible to still save money even if you have a busy life? Yes, it absolutely is. In fact, there's a lot of ways you can even automate money saving where you do it once and then because you've set it up, you'll save money over and over again. So look, I look at some of those in the book. I think also for a lot of people, I completely understand where they're coming from, being busy or even almost allergic to thinking about money. That's how a lot of people feel about money in the pit of their stomach when they have to confront it. I was pretty hopeless with money until I started working in this area about a decade ago. So I have a background (laughs) as somebody who didn't enjoy talking or thinking about money and then kind of learned it on the job, if you like, and became passionate about it in that way. I think this year will be one of those years where people who previously have been too busy or too lazy or whatever to focus on some of this stuff will have to. The reality is the average mortgage has gone up by over $10,000 per annum in interest costs. It's in the past eight months alone, we're going to get another rate rise probably. It's just huge. It's just really, really hard to imagine, actually. Phenomenal. New, there's new information out uh, today about rents too, which have gone up 10, 15% in some parts of the country in the past year. And then you've got your power bills up 20% in the past year. Groceries are up over 10%. So look, it's just not going to be an option this year for a lot of people to put this one on the back burner because we're going to have to find money to pay for those essentials. But also I, what I say to people is I try really hard to save on the boring stuff, the household bills so that I've got a bit more money to spend on the fun stuff, on my family and on holidays and discretionary stuff. So we're not sort of uh, 
penny pinches in every aspect of our lives. We we basically, I, you know, I focus on this stuff as a means to an end, so that we can have a better life in the areas where it's actually important to have a bit of extra money. And I think it's still possible if you get all the settings right and you kind of really kill your bills, it is still possible to have some money for the fun stuff in life. So I'd say that to people. Some of the richest people I've ever known were the best at this stuff. So they didn't need to do it. They did it because maybe part of the reason they got rich is because they didn't like giving money away. So (laughs) before we even start looking at our bills, let's make sure in the free money chapter, we haven't got some money sitting out there in a government bank account or the tax office hundreds or even thousands of dollars, which belongs to us, which we haven't got around to reclaiming. So there you go. So the free money, you talk about the free money in your book. And I did sort of know about this, but I hadn't been as perhaps focused on it. And of course, I couldn't help but try and see if I had any free money. I didn't, but I think I'm going to have to continue searching. So what is this free money and how do you find it? So yeah, what I've done is I've gone and pulled together all the different places where you know, I calculate there's about $18 billion worth of our money sitting with governments, banks, the tax office, super funds in a variety of different pots waiting for us to claim it back. So I've kind of grouped them all under the heading of free money or money for nothing because I'm a big Dire Straits fan. And, um, and that, <laughs> that first new chapter is all about the different places you should check. Now, the first place everyone should go is what they call unclaimed money. And this is billions of dollars that state and federal governments are holding on to for us. There's no limit on uh, when we can claim it. You know, it might be from 20 years ago. Basically, every time you move house and change address, for example, if a cheque comes to that address later on, doesn't get cashed, it ends up going into government consolidated revenue and government holds on to it for us. So kind of them. Yeah, very kind of them. But uh, the reality is it only takes a couple of minutes to check if they've got anything for you. And there's a different website for federal government and each state government. So most people just need to check two of the websites. Let's say I live in New South Wales, I'll search federal government or ASIC unclaimed money because ASIC, the federal agency, is is the one that holds and and reports on federal government money. And then in New South Wales, I'll search New South Wales, search New South Wales unclaimed money, the state government site will come up and there's a couple of quick searches you can do just to check if there's any cash out there for you. And look, I didn't find any for me like you didn't, but my dad found money. We found some money for my great aunt and I uh, just had an email from a, a reader who said she found uh, thousands of dollars between her dad and her husband and a friend. They found thousands of dollars sitting there, which was just waiting for them to come, 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 come and claim it back, which they didn't know it was there. Well, it looks like I'm going to have to go back and put in names of everyone I can think of in my family. And one thing I almost forgot about was that I had a former surname in my first marriage. And I don't know why I keep forgetting about that because I had that name for, oh, I can't remember, 11 years or something. But, you know, like I, I keep forgetting that I had this whole other surname. It's weird. So thinking about, you know, other names people might have as well. Yes. Uh, any names you've had, if you've lived in multiple states, make sure you search in multiple states. And the other one is search for friends and family, you know. I mean, I've found money there. I <laughs> say in the book, I've found money there for People like Scott Morrison, Kevin Rudd, <laughs> billionaires like Clive Palmer, Pratt family have got money sitting there. So Just a few extra hundred or thousand, but you know, it all adds up. Yeah, well, it's nothing to them, but uh, I wish I could claim it back for myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. One of the things I love about your writing is your negotiating tips. Now, Australians, as you know, are so squeamish about negotiating. I spent time in uh, living in China. And I have a lot of Chinese speaking friends in Australia and they are so good at negotiating. It's just so much part of their culture. And yet I'm still Australian. And even though I know how to do this and I know I should do this, I still feel really weird about it. So how can people really get started with negotiating? Yeah, we're stuck in this kind of halfway zone in Australia, aren't we? Where you can, at some shops you can negotiate, at others you can't. The sticker price is the sticker price. And so it's actually a bit hard for us to know when to, you know, when to try and negotiate, even if we want to. But as I say in the book, there's I quote a travel writer called Ben Groundwater, who has this great line in one of his um, articles where he says, there's a, there's a name for people like us who don't feel comfortable negotiating. We're called Westerners. <laughs> <laughs> a cultural thing where we, we're not, we don't learn it necessarily in most families. And so you have to, you, you have to sort of teach yourself. What I do say in the book is that The key to good negotiation isn't being born with the skill necessarily or being taught it necessarily. The key is leverage. 
And uh, even the Henry Kissinger used to say, talk softly and carry a big stick. You don't need to be a real ball breaker, a negotiator to kind of get a good result. You just have to have leverage. And when it comes to your household bills, the best leverage is a really cracking hot deal from another provider. So if you're on the phone or writing a, a note to your energy company, if you know what the cheapest energy plan on the market is because you've checked, because you know that you've got the tools, you know which sites to check in a couple of minutes and, and they'll tell you which is the cheapest plan around. You mention that and you speak to your retailer, they'll often match it. They'll sometimes have a bottom, what I call an under the table deal, which they'll pull out of the bottom drawer and suddenly they're able to beat you know, the best advertised deal on the, on, the, on the government comparison site. These things do happen. So leverage is key. There are scripts in the book for people who are not super confident about what to say. And the key is just knowing basically where the bottom of the market is before you make that call or send that email. Yeah, and as you point out in, in your book, these days with the internet, Google is your friend. You can research what the competitors are doing so easily and it only takes a couple of minutes. So there's really no excuse for not doing a bit of research. And, you know, one of my pet bugbears is the amount of people who sit on these mortgages all their life and they just, they never, they just never question it. Like they'll go to one of the big banks because they see them at their local shopping centre and they'll get the mortgage with them, but they won't even shop around before they do. And then they just sit there. And it's not that hard to ask for a rate review. In fact, I'm about to go through this process because I've got some mortgage cases coming off a fixed rate next month. I was very fortunate to fix when I did, which is good, but now I've got the problem of everything's a lot higher. But yes, it just doesn't it just doesn't hurt to ask, does it? It never hurts to ask. And mortgage is a classic example. Usually just by calling up and asking, you will get a result. And the thing is with mortgages, even if you just get 20 basis points knocked off your rate, that can be thousands of dollars over time. Yeah. Someone who read Kill Bills and then has used the script in the mortgage chapter of that book about sort of five times since. He, he was recently interviewed by A Current Affair for a, a story about the launch of, of this book. And, you know, he reckons he saved tens of thousands of dollars over the years just by calling up and asking the question once a year. And he used the script. So he didn't have to kind of be a confident negotiator, but he's used it again and again and again. And it just goes to show that if those who ask shall receive. <laughs> and even if I say, well, even if you're not super confident getting on the phone, Put it in writing to them. It works in, in writing as well. You might not get an immediate response, but they'll respond at some point. Yeah, and you can you can save a lot of money just by being a bit of a squeaky wheel. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because it costs them a lot in terms of advertising and admin and all sorts of things to get a new customer. So why not retain them if, if, if it's worked that cheaper for them as well? Yeah, it actually costs over $1,000 for, for most mortgage lenders. Businesses have what they call a cost of acquisition, a number that they are prepared to pay for a customer and they've worked out that if they pay this up to this amount for a customer, then they'll make money out of them over time. And so they have a number in their head for what uh, they're prepared to pay and what it, what it costs to get a new customer. Now, if you ring up and you're an existing customer and you try to get uh, a better deal out of them, it's cheaper then for them often to give you a better deal than it is to say goodbye and then go out and find someone else to replace you. And that's just the business kind of dollars and cents kind of equation that they're going through in their in their heads and often call center people particularly if they're in the what they call the retention department a lot of big businesses have a dedicated call center that just deals with people who are trying to leave giving them better deals to try and make them stay and if, if you get through to that retention team or <laughs> i called my energy retailer recently and they put me through to the best offer department which was their name for the retention team <laughs> <laughs> Once you're on the phone to those guys, honestly, you can't lose. Mm, and you, you, I'm laughing a bit because why wouldn't they give the best offer to all of their, their customers, especially their loyal customers who've been with them for a long time? But as you, you, you talk about in, in your book, you know, most times companies don't really recognise and reward loyalty. Sometimes they do, but not very often. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Look, I, I do say in the book, I think the single most important kind of attitude or money-saving strategy you need to have is what I call the De Niro. It's named after Robert De Niro in one of my favourite movies. And there's this great quote in the movie Heat where he says, you need to be willing to walk away 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat coming around the corner. Now, he's a bank robber, so he's talking about how you can survive as an arch criminal. But basically, you have to have the same ruthless kind of approach to your household bills and be willing to be disloyal and to move. Uh, if you want to pay as little as possible over time. Because if you don't, 
you're not prepared to move, unfortunately, a lot of them will just ratchet up your price over time more and more. And eventually, you'll end up funding all those great deals for the people who are prepared to shop around and switch and move. We talked about the loyalty tax. The RBA says that the current loyalty tax on mortgages, for example, the difference between what new customers pay on average and old loyal customers is almost half of 1%, 47 basis points. It's thousands of dollars, you know, on some loans, thousands of dollars each year on some loans. And that's the difference just from being loyal versus being one of those super sexy, attractive new customers that businesses really love. (laughs) I have to be honest and say I'm a very disloyal mortgage holder. I have switched many times and actually mortgages and switching is one of those ones which unfortunately is a fairly expensive exercise. It always ends up being more expensive than you think. And so I'm always in favour of staying if I can. But the last time I went to switch, I had a particular problem that actually put me on the wrong deal and it was more expensive than I had thought and what they'd originally told me. And I just couldn't get through at all. So customer service after customer service, I wrote complaints, I sought feedback. And in the end, I was like, well, really, they just don't want my business. So I moved. And even in the moving process, they didn't want to get me back. Later on, I found out that there were actually some major organizational problems with them. So I was kind of at that stage where I was like, if they are really this disorganized, I need to move. But I'm happy where I am. So I'll try and stay where I am if I can. Like I said, this process is starting because my mortgages come off fixed in about two weeks. But yes, but you can't just assume that when they come off fixed, I'm going to be on the best deal because I don't know that. No, in fact, you almost certainly won't be because the, the revert rate, whether it's a, you know, a credit card with an introductory offer or it's a fixed rate mortgage uh, or whatever, the revert rate is almost always where they make their big margin out of customers because a certain proportion they know will stay and won't switch. And that's often where they make their make their money. Now, there's millions of people in the same boat as you. I'm going to be in the same boat as you later this year. Who, who locked in those very low fixed mm. pandemic rates and are now going to have to come off, you know, rates that were around 2% and move to rates that are going to be around 5% or, you know, still depends on your borrowing capacity and that sort of stuff. But it's a massive, massive increase. Obviously, that's more than double the interest cost, two to five. So yeah. it's going to be really important this year. And, you know, for example, right now there are some big cashback deals in the market up to $5,000 for refinances because, Lenders are fighting tooth and nail for these people who are refinancing. But just make sure, I I say to people, just make sure that you're looking at the low rate first because the cashback is just a bonus because even a difference in in rate of 1% or half of a percent can add up to thousands of dollars each year uh, in extra interest. And thousands of dollars, when you think of that in terms of your working hours, that's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. I call the mortgage the big kahuna because... You know, we do. We sometimes tear our hair out about energy bills and stuff, but the average energy bill is sort of two to two and a half thousand dollars. Mortgages, just sort of cutting a half a percent off your rate, can easily save you more than your power bill in a year. So if you can get the big ones right, it'll help you pay for a lot of the smaller bills, which are also going up very steeply. Wow! Thank you for that. Now I want to talk, or, or get you to talk about. Your experience with a dispute. So you had some problems with your Wi-Fi and I'm sure many people can relate. My sister, I was speaking to her recently and her whole MBN was taken out during a house renovation and her son, my nephew, was nearly beside himself. It was like life was over. But you dealt without Wi-Fi for a whole month, I believe. Yeah, this was a few years ago and it was, it was, I'm surprised we managed to get through a month in the end. Like when you, I've got Two kids now, 10 and 12, so they were probably seven and uh, nine at the time. And, and when you cut the Netflix off from a seven and nine-year-old, it's like it's like uh, taking them off life support. That's basically... <laughs> I was going to say drugs, but, you know, both. <laughs> <laughs> similar, similar. <laughs> I joke that we even had, we had to read books. It was like the 1980s. Look, we found ways around it. We tethered off our phones, off our mobile plans and that sort of stuff, obviously. So we, we weren't completely without um, connectivity, but that, that had its own issues because, you know, I busted my data cap, for example, doing that. But in, in the end, it was a really good lesson in how to, what I call how to whinge well. And that's when you've got a problem with a, with a service provider and you want to get a resolution. How do you get a resolution with as little effort and grief as possible? And so what I say is there's three steps. First of all, you whinge to the boss. So you ask to speak to a manager, find someone with the authority to make a decision if you can, let them know what your problem is, tell them what you want as a resolution, 
If you don't get a, a result there, then you take it to the next step, which is to whinge in public. And I say, you know, people used to stand outside businesses with sandwich boards strapped to themselves <laughs> uh, with their complaint on it. Well, we have social media now. We don't need to do that. We can actually complain on Twitter, Facebook. And a lot of businesses spend a lot of time monitoring these social media accounts. It's their shop window. They take it very seriously. And often it's a good way to get your message through if you haven't been able to get a result directly on the phone with a manager or whatever. I even spoke to one woman I've mentioned in the book who she stalked the CEO of a particular company on LinkedIn, the kind of human resources uh, social network. Oh, gosh, you can stalk anyone on LinkedIn. It is just so useful for finding out who does what. Yeah, found the decision maker and contacted them directly and uh, and got a resolution that way. Look, the third step, if you don't get a result from whinging in public, that's when you've got to take it to the regulator or a third, the umpire. And every every industry has a regulator. There's, there's always a higher power. And what I did find with our NBN was that as soon as we took it to the telecommunications industry ombudsman, the TIO, as soon as we made a complaint, that effectively triggered a process where it created a file number internally at the NBN provider. Someone contacted us, someone whose job it was just to respond to these regulator complaints, contacted us directly. The NBN came back on pretty soon afterwards. Look, my complaint wasn't the reason it came back on. There was an issue where a local electricity network had accidentally cut the wrong wire when doing some poles and wires work. But the point is, it came back on and they gave us a credit for, I think, $460 to cover not just the money we'd spent with them in that four weeks, but extra money to make up for it as compensation. And they also completely reimbursed uh, the extra mobile bills we'd, 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 we'd accrued. So we got a really good result. Yes, we were without NBN for a month, which was very difficult, but it just showed me that it's really important if you need to take it to that regulator, that that ombudsman or whatever it is in the different industry, then it can give you a really good result. And was it expensive for you to file that or was it hard in terms of time? It was free and it just took about five minutes to fill out the form. I've since had a good conversation with a journalist called John Rolfe who works at the News Corp Papers and he, he writes a column called Public Defender. So he deals a lot with this, people having issues with businesses and trying to get a resolution. His rule is call once, write once, and then take it to the higher power. So very similar, I suppose, to my three steps. But he says politely call, write once, say exactly what the issue is, what resolution you want. Don't be afraid to ask for extra compensation for, for the inconvenience or whatever. And then if you don't get a result, take it to a higher power. Well, I must say, actually, I threatened to take someone to the tribunal late last year, so I was unhappy with a particular property manager. So it was a long story, but I had concern that there was potential mould in the property and they were sort of very pro the tenant. Now, not being nothing's wrong being pro the tenant. It's just there were some maintenance issues and I didn't feel they were attending to that. And any time I raised it, it was a bit like, well, the property is old. It was like, no, <laughs> I have a responsibility as a landlord to do certain maintenance things. And if you do not attend to this, and if you do not get someone in to do attend to this by this date, I will take you to the tribunal. And I'd also sent notice to get rid of or to end that lease as well. But in that meantime, they just weren't doing things. And I must say that did get a resolution. Now, I don't like to do that lightly, but I was very prepared to do that. I'd already researched the process and I was definitely going to be doing that by Monday if they hadn't come back with, with some things. But they did actually send out some trace people by then and they did actually get it done. But yes, it is. I think sometimes you do have to show that you you are willing to to go through with this, especially if you know you're right. If you've done your research, you've done your consultations, you know that you are in a, a good position. You're not just being frivolous, but you know that something is not right. Yeah, like I think it's a bit like switching providers, isn't it? Sometimes often you don't end up switching. You end up getting a better deal from your current provider because you're prepared to walk away. Most people, like you said, with your mortgage, most people prefer to just get a great result with their current provider if they're happy with them and not have to move. And often that's what happens. But it's the same when you've got a complaint. You need to be prepared to make that make that complaint to follow through if you don't get a result because otherwise I guess they can call you bluff, can't they? <laughs> yeah, they can. So one of the easy ways I think to save money, and you talk about this so well in your book, is telco. So we talked about your problem with your, your Wi-Fi, but often – People, particularly with their mobile phones, they just are willing to pay a lot for it. And I don't kind of get it. I really don't. And I had a situation around about, ooh, maybe 18 months ago now, I was having a coffee meeting with someone and 
there wasn't particularly good internet connectivity there, but I could get through. And why we knew this is because this cafe had those QR codes that some do have now for ordering. So I was able to very easily order and my friend couldn't. And she turned to me and she said, well, you must have a much better deal than mine. And I said, well, what are you on? And she's like, oh, I pay $45 a month for this special business account with, you know, one of the big name providers. Well, I didn't. I had a deal where I had a prepaid plan and it worked out about $8.25 a month. And I was a bit shocked by that because she was obviously paying so much more and yet it wasn't better in terms of, of service or it didn't seem to be. Is this common that people are just paying so much more? I think it is. Yeah, I really think it is. I see a lot of uh, mobile plans that are 50 or even $100 a month. You know, I think there was a time probably 10 years ago when that was a bit more common and maybe a bit more necessary to pay more, but the price has come down so much and the inclusions have gone up so much, but people who haven't looked around and switched in a while, probably on those legacy plans, which are way more expensive. The other thing is the ACCC says the average Australian only uses 12 gigabytes of data a month. But some of us are on plans with hundreds of gigabytes of data, and I bet most of them aren't being aren't using anywhere near that amount. So wow, yeah, we're probably over we're probably overestimating what we need, and therefore paying more. But this is also a trick by some of the particularly some of the bigger telcos. Look, there are more mobile phones than people in Australia. It's a saturated market because there aren't many new people to sign up. What they have to do is get more money out of the people who are already signed up, and one of the ways they do that chuck in all these sort of uh, features and you just need to check whether those features are actually of any real value to you. Like 500 gigabytes of data, if you're using 20 gigabytes a month, there's no need to pay extra for that. You can, as you say, sometimes you can get a plan for around $10 or less a month if you're prepared to bulk buy data, for example, over six or 12 months. So yeah, it is really so, so cheap now if you look at the, um, the cheapest deals on the market. Yeah, and I I don't understand why people use so much data. Like I understand because I upload a lot of things to Instagram and I take a lot of videos and I upload that. But a lot of the times when I do the uploads, it's at home when I'm on the Wi-Fi because it's a better network anyway. And a lot more places now have free Wi-Fi. A lot more workplaces have free Wi-Fi. A lot of people working from home where there's Wi-Fi. So I just actually don't understand why people need that much data. Even 12 gigabytes seems a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, it probably, probably does for a lot of us. And I, and I think most people probably don't even check what they're using, but if they did, they'd see that they're using a fraction of what they're paying for. A great trick at the moment is there's a whole lot of double data offers in the market. You get double data for the first six months. There's also a number of plans that have what's called data banking where it doesn't expire and it piles up. Yep. So if you can get a plan that has both of those things, double data for six months and data banking, you can actually get take out a plan with relatively low amount of data You've got the double data for the first six months, so you don't have to worry about busting the cap. That's going to pile up when you don't use it, and you've got this big buffer uh, and you probably never have to worry about busting your cap again. Fabulous. And I have one final question to ask you, and I thought I was going to ask a whole lot more things in this podcast, but time has gone so quickly, which often does when I'm chatting with you, which is, do you have a favourite Fruglister tip to share? Now, often I will ask my guests for one particularly. But I know you have a whole book full of them, but do you have a, a particular favourite one? Look, I think I'd, I'd have to nominate petrol price apps. And I'm, the reason I say that is because almost every state and territory in the country now has mandated petrol retailers to share their pricing every 15 minutes with app developers, except there's two holdouts. One is the ACT. I was laughing because I, I live in the ACT. <laughs> and the other one is Victoria. I don't know why Victoria is uh, living in the dark ages on this either, but less than half of Australians, as far as I can see, are still using these apps and they're fantastic. They can save you sometimes 40 or 50 cents a litre. All you need to do before you pull out of the driveway, don't do it while you're driving, obviously, but just jump on and check which uh, petrol station near you has the cheapest fuel. Sometimes when the you know you're at the curves in the petrol price cycle, the difference can be 40 or 50 cents a litre between two stations that are just a kilometre apart. So absolutely get onto one of those. Petrol Spy is the best one according to choice in terms of accuracy. So if you're going to have a look at one, have a look at that. But there's others called Easy Street or um, Fuel Map Australia. There's about a dozen of them actually now. Thank you for that. And um, make sure to check out Joel's book, What Easy Money, Seven Steps to Bust Your Bills, available, I'm assuming, online and at all good bookstores. Well, what's this, what do they say? Where all good books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So make sure to check out his book. And Joel, where else can people find you? 
Yeah, well, my, my weekly column in the SNH and the Age is, is in there every Wednesday in the money section. I'm often on Today's Show on Wednesdays as well. And uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and actually I've just launched a TikTok account, uh, Joel M. Gibson. Woohoo! Uh, I'm going to try and post an, a new money-saving hack every day for 365 days this year just to celebrate the launch of the book. So we'll see how that goes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please also join the Joyful Frugalista Facebook group and to chat about saving money and all things. Thank you. You've been listening to the Joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. And of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. Every night